Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to D4, D&D Deep Dive. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons. We theorycraft about them, we crunch numbers about them, not with the intent to tell you the right way or the best or only way to play a certain character, but to explore one possible way to build and play a character with the hopes of creating something that is both really fun but also powerful to play in game. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on building and playing a particular character that you're thinking about, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I am really glad that you're here, so thank you for being here. My name's Colby, and I'll be your host. As most of you know, Wizards of the Coast released a new book a couple of weeks ago. As I'm recording this, anyway, by the time this releases, it'll be more like a month ago. But anyway, it's called Spelljammer. Adventures in Space. Pigs, Pigs in, in Space. space. <laughs> Any other Muppet Show fans out there? Okay. Now, I'm going to be honest. I don't know if I'd say I'm head over heels in love with the book, personally. I'm not opposed to it. It's totally cool if you love it. And I think my DM, Corey, actually really does, which means he's probably going to be incorporating a bunch of it into our upcoming games on our Tales of Anaria channel over there if you want to watch us play D&D. And that's fine. I'm sure it'll be awesome. For me, while I really love science fiction, I do, I tend to prefer to keep just a little bit of a separation between my fantasy and my sci-fi, thank you very much. And this book has, well, a pretty sci-fi feel to it, right? I mean, it's not like it's hard science fiction or anything. We're not playing in the world of Isaac Asimov, but still. That said, as someone who's keenly interested in character creation and as a channel that's devoted to character creation for D&D, I can't help but be very fascinated by the new race options that are available in the book more than anything else that's in there. And, you know, among the new races that are available, for those who don't know, we've got the Astral Elf, which is basically a space elf that can kind of misty step, similar to like the Aladrin or the Shatter Kai. The Auto Gnome, a cool little construct race. The Gif, which are basically bipedal hippos. The Hidozi, which are absolutely terrifying flying monkeys, and I know that there's been a little controversy around them recently that I'm not going to get into. We've got the Plasmoids, um, so we can finally fulfill our fantasy of playing as a bowl of jello. And finally, the Thrykreen. For those of us who are not insect averse as I am. <laughs> now, while all of these races have some pretty cool, interesting, and potentially useful features, the race that stands out as perhaps the most powerful from a purely mechanics perspective is the last, I think, the Thrykreen. The main reason being their secondary arms. In case you didn't know, Thrykreen have two extra arms smaller than their main arms. I guess that's a thing now in D&D. And these secondary arms can be used to do a limited number of things. Manipulate an object, open or close things, pick up or set down a tiny object, and finally, and most potently, wield a weapon that has the light property. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> you guys have known that the wheels have been spinning in my head about this ever since the Unearthed Arcana came out a long time ago, right? I mean, this allows for a lot of interesting possibilities. Right off the bat, I'm sure we're all thinking dual wielding while still holding a shield, right? Great, a free plus two to armor class? Makes me happy. But one option that this can grant us that might not be readily apparent, though I believe it should work, rules is written, is the ability to attack with both light weapons and non-light weapons and still yet take advantage of two-weapon fighting. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. Buttercup is marrying Humperdinck in little less than half an hour. All right, first up, we have to understand how the extra attack feature works. For those classes that get extra attack, here is how the feature reads. Beginning at fifth level, you can attack twice instead of once whenever you take the attack action on your turn. Members of the jury, does this description say anywhere that the second attack that you make has to be made with the same weapon as the first attack that you make? Uh, nope. Okay. That's important to know. Assuming then that our DM isn't going to force our second attack from extra attack to be made with the same weapon, we could conceivably, as a Thrykreen, make one attack with one of our little T-Rex arms. <laughs> 
holding a light weapon like a short sword, then as our second attack granted us from extra attack, make an attack with, say, a great sword that we were holding with our two main hands, right? Right. There's not a lot of benefit to doing that, of course, you just make two attacks with your great sword, unless we look at two weapon fighting. And here is what Wizards of the Coast has said about that rule. When you take the attack action and attack with a light melee weapon that you're holding in one hand, you can use a bonus action to attack with a different light melee weapon that you're holding in the other hand. Members of the jury, does it say anywhere in there that all of the attacks that you make on this turn must be made with light weapons in order to be granted the bonus action attack with a light weapon? Uh, nope. So, as long as we take the attack action and make at least one attack with a light weapon as part of that attack action, we should be free to make a bonus action weapon attack with a light weapon we're holding in the other hand, right? And that's regardless of whether another attack that we made on that same turn was made with a non-light weapon. Here's hoping that between now and when this video comes out, Jeremy Crawford doesn't release a tweet saying that you can't do that. Now, while the image of a whirling dervish of blades, you know, somebody holding a great sword and two short swords, just making all kinds of attacks, is really cool. The reality is, it's not that much more powerful, mechanically speaking, than just making short swords attacks. Sure, a great sword does 2d6 of damage as opposed to the short swords 1d6. So you're basically gaining an extra three and a half points of damage on average compared to other dual wielders who are just making attacks with short swords. But that's not anything crazy, and as we seem to be repeating on this channel a lot lately, the weapon properties tend to be a lot more important than the weapon damage values, right? I mean, the real reason that you'd use a greatsword is so that you could get the great weapon master feat and add 10 damage to every attack you make with it, right? So using a greatsword and not making as many attacks as possible with that greatsword feels a little odd. Or, I mean, of course, better yet, as most of us know, you know, you're even better off taking a polearm that does 1d10 slightly less, but then with the polearm master feat and the great weapon master feat, you can make three attacks in a turn once you have extra attack, all of which get that plus 10 to damage. But, but, if you're just committed to getting as much damage as you possibly can while dual wielding, this is a little bump if you were to go Thrykreen. And, I do think there's another potentially cool way to take advantage of this I can dual wield light weapons and have another weapon in my main hand feature that's available to Thrykreen, but it's something that we are primarily going to be using for control purposes. And that is what we're going to be focusing on with our Thrykreen build today. An attempt at building like the ultimate martial control character. We'll keep an eye on their DPR, damage per round, as we go to make sure they're not falling too far behind other builds, but our main goal is going to be finding great ways to exert control on the battlefield with our gross buggy self. But that said, for those who are interested in getting a little more damage out of this concept with a little less potential control, so sacrificing a little control for a little more damage, stay tuned and in the final thoughts I'll go over how to tweak it in order to do just that. But for the rest of us, I proudly present episode 108, The Praying Mantis. Big thanks to my good friend Randall Hampton who has created this fantastic artwork for the character concept that I sent him here. I love it, it's amazing, it always is every single week. You guys know this, and yeah, if you're interested in following Randall to see the other artwork that he puts out, and potentially commissioning him to create some art for your character or even your party, I will, as always, put links in the video description for how to do just that. Thanks Randall, you're amazing. But, before we jump into the build, and speaking of science fiction, this is definitely like a science fiction themed episode today, I wanted to tell you guys about a new sponsor for the video this week that I'm super excited about. a company called Penny Dragon Games, who right now have a product in Kickstarter that's almost finished and it's called Waystar. The Kickstarter for Waystar ends September 19th, so there's just a few more days at the time of this video release left to back them. They've already completely destroyed their funding goal, like at the time of this recording, they've been funded to the tune of 15 times their funding goal, and I'm sure by the time this releases there'll be way more than that. The project is greenlit, it is go, it's going to be published. Waystar is a total D&D &D 5e conversion into a science fiction universe, and that actually is 
something I can get a little bit more behind than just sort of mingling science fiction with fantasy in the same world. It's designed to do three things. One, to use familiar rules so you can hit the ground running with minimal effort. Two, create a fast-paced, immersive, action-packed experience. And three, accommodate campaigns that feel like your favorite science fiction media. So it's going to give you options that let you run a campaign that's going to feel like Mass Effect and or maybe Firefly, two of my favorite science fiction properties, by the way. And the Kickstarter includes, at launch here, four books. Core Rules, which will give you everything you need, both for players and GMs, to run the game, including flexible character creation tools with new classes, new species and races, rules for combat, ship creation, space combat, space travel, gear, cybernetics, robotics, and so much more. But just in case that's not enough, there is also the Creature Codex available, which is essentially the monster manual in a sci-fi galactic setting. You've got the Galactic Archives book, which is maybe more equivalent to like the DMG. It's got a lot more lore, politics, geography, things about the galaxy, ways to enhance your game and really immerse your players in this universe. And then finally, an action-packed heist adventure called Steal the Stars. So. If you would really love to see a lot more ion cannons, evil droids, laser swords, jump gates, and destroyer ships in your TTRPG, but still be able to play with a familiar 5e rule set, you have got to check out Waystar. Back them before the Kickstarter finishes so you can both help them reach their stretch goals and then also take advantage of all the benefits you get from backing them while they're in Kickstarter, right? I of course will post the URL in the video description as always and I'd appreciate it if you'd use that link so that they know I sent you and see for yourself just how fantastic this sci-fi 5e conversion truly is. Huge thanks to Penny Dragon Games. Congrats on crushing your funding goal. I can't wait to see the finished product. And let's jump into the build. All right, at level one, any self-respecting praying mantis wants to be good at grappling, right? So of course, as a marshal, we are going to be doing some grappling on this character. And when it comes to grappling, I think there's a subclass that's better at it than any other character in D&D 5e. And it happens to be a fighter, so that's where we're starting with this character. So when we first meet our champion, they are maybe a fighter in their queen's royal guard, I think. And I don't know a ton about Thrykreen lore, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming they have like a bug queen. <laughs> Regardless, this particular soldier is being trained in some magical and arcane abilities as well in order to enhance their already formidable martial prowess to better enable them to protect those they have sworn to defend. So yes, for our race, as I've said, we're going Thrykreen, and interestingly about the Thrykreen, their creature type is monstrosity, meaning that if there's something that would potentially affect humanoids only, like say whole person, it won't work against you. That could be good, could be bad, depending on what we're talking about. There are some really cool features that the Thrykreen get. First up, we get Chameleon Carapace, which is really neat, but sadly, I don't think I'm going to be making a ton of use out of this feature on this character. I can definitely see you building around Chameleon Carapace. First off, we're told that your AC is a 13 plus your dexterity modifier if you're not wearing armor, meaning that if you had a dex modifier of plus five, your AC would be as good as if you were wearing plate mail, right? That's awesome. But since we are going to be grappling a lot, we're going to be focusing on strength. So this won't be amazing for us, especially like after the early game. Still cool. Even cooler, you can use an action to change your carapace color to match your surroundings, giving you advantage on stealth checks specifically to hide in your surroundings. Again, not something that we will be taking advantage of a lot, I don't think, but I can definitely see a rogue built with this in mind, finding some really consistent ways to get advantage every round, things like that. Um, also worth noting, there's a feature called Thrykreen Telepathy, which tells us that we can't speak any non-Thrykreen languages. What's kind of amazing, though, is that you can instead communicate telepathy telepathically to any willing creatures you can see within 120 feet. They simply need to be able to understand one language. That could definitely come in handy in certain situations where you're like trying to pull a fast one on whoever your group is talking to, yeah? But keep in mind, it does not say that the creature can communicate back to us telepathically. So make sure everyone at the table knows how this works and doesn't just go blabbing about your secret plans thinking that they're transmitting their thoughts to you telepathically. But my favorite and the most powerful feature, like I've mentioned earlier, is the secondary arms. I talked about it already in the preamble, but yes, we're planning on dual wielding light weapons here. 
As for our ability scores, I'm assuming that we're using the point by method as always and suggest going with a 15 strength, taking a plus one there, a 15 constitution and a plus one there, and a 15 dexterity and a plus one there. I really love the ability to start with three plus ones and thus three 16s on a character that we get nowadays from our race selection. But of course that does mean that we are dumping intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. If that sounds like a terrible idea to you, feel free to scale it back a bit on the constitution and or dexterity scores. I'll just take my chances on getting mind controlled. As for our equipment, I'm gonna recommend going with the gold buy method and say that we need to take a shield, a whip, and two short swords. And yes, you heard me right, we want a whip. I'll get into why a little bit later, but also, yes, we can, as I've said, equip a shield on this character and still dual wield with our baby arms, so that's awesome. And no, we don't really need any armor for now, since chainmail would put us at a 16, and thanks to our carapace plus our dexterity modifier, we'd be at a 16 without any armor, so yeah, might as well go naked, for now. As a fighter, at level one, we get second wind, which lets us heal ourselves as a bonus action for 1d10 plus our fighter level, once per short rest, always handy, and then we get a fighting style. And I'm gonna recommend that we go with two weapon fighting. There are other things we could take, of course, unarmed fighting, superior technique, and interception would all have some value on this character, but I wanna get the most out of our T-Rex arms, and that means taking the two weapon fighting style so that when we use two weapon fighting, the attack we make with the light weapon in our other hand as a bonus action, right, gets to add our ability score modifier to the damage. It's a nice little damage bump for us. At level two, we'd get Action Surge, of course, which is just almost limitless in its usefulness, giving us the opportunity to do more damage on a round, potentially, or grapple and still make a full round of attacks, etc., etc. We love Action Surge. At level three, we get our fighter subclass, our martial archetype, and yeah, I'm gonna recommend that we go Rune Knight. For a character who wants to be grappling all of the time, it's really hard to go with anything other than Rune Knight, in my opinion. Not that you can't be an effective grappler otherwise, you totally can, but Rune Knight just makes it easier than anything else. And since I wanted two weapon fighting, fighting style anyway, plus weapon and shield proficiencies, not to mention constitution saving throw proficiency, heavy armor proficiency, and the extra feat or ability score increase that fighters get at level 6, it just really seemed like the obvious choice. Primarily, of course, for the Giant's Might feature. But before we talk about why, let's remind everyone about some important things about grappling. To grapple, you take the attack action and make a special attack, a grapple attack. You need to have at least one free hand to do so, hence the benefit of T-Rex arms, which let us dual wield and still grapple one or even potentially two enemies. You pit your athletics check against your enemy's athletics or acrobatics check, their choice. And if yours is higher, they're grappled, which means that their move speed is zero. It's a really nice way to exert some control over the battlefield. If they want to break your grapple, they have to spend an action to try and do so, making another acrobatics or athletics check against your own. You can drag them at half your move speed. Now, we need to keep in mind that you cannot grapple a creature who is more than one size larger than you. So for right now, as a medium creature, that means large creatures are smaller. Of course, there are a lot of enemies that are bigger than large size and thus enter giant's might, which tells us that with our bonus action, proficiency bonus times per day, we can grow to a large size for one minute. And thus, right off, we have a very easy and reliable way to now grapple enemies who are huge size or smaller. And that's huge, sorry. Not only that, but while Giant Smite is active, we have advantage on strength checks and saves. And since athletics is a strength check, we will now have advantage on all of our grapple checks, not to mention shoves too, which we'll talk about later. So long as Giant's Might is active, right? One final little perk, while transformed, we can do an extra 1d6 of damage on one weapon attack per turn. So yeah, it's really just kind of perfect for us. Of course, we also love the Rune Carver feature that Rune Knights get, which lets us pick two runes from a nice little list to carve into our weapons or armor or something that we're wearing. And then we get some nice little kind of passive benefits from the runes that we choose. And then once per short rest, we can activate them for some really great benefits. I'm for sure going with Cloud Rune because it's just the best thing in the universe. Letting us use our reaction once per short rest to cause an attack from an enemy within 30 feet of us to target not the target that they hit, but instead a different target of our choosing, also within 30 feet. 
I've gotten into so many amazing shenanigans with this rune that longtime viewers have probably seen that I just cannot imagine going rune knight and not taking this. But as for the second one, I think on this character I'd probably go with frost rune. With frost rune, you invoke it as a bonus action, and then for 10 minutes, which is nice, we get a plus two to all of our strength and constitution checks and saves. That's really quite nice. And we'll make our grapples that much better, not to mention our constitution saving throws and thus our concentration checks, which we will enjoy later. At level four, we get our first ability score increase or feat and I'm gonna recommend that we take the sentinel feat and the sentinel feat is one of the things that makes this build so cool and fun and a little unique I think I haven't taken sentinel on a build in forever but it's a fantastic feat let's review when a creature within five feet of you makes an attack against a target other than you you can use your reaction to make an attack against them that's a nice little bit of extra damage that we really tried to take advantage of actually in our two character episode of the wolf and the coyote. For us, it'll be a nice option if we're not using our reaction otherwise, though I think we often will be, especially as we progress in character levels. Also with Sentinel, you can make an opportunity attack against an enemy even if they take the disengage action. I really hope your DM doesn't metagame you and like never have enemies take the disengage action because they just kind of know that you're going to be able to make an opportunity attack against them anyway. But most important for us, when you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, their speed becomes zero for the rest of their turn. Now, let's quickly review what triggers an opportunity attack. As per the rules, you use your reaction to take an opportunity attack, quote, when a hostile creature that you can see moves out of your reach. So for the vast majority of players, this will mean when an enemy that's standing right next to them moves away from them since most of us have a five foot reach, right? Of course, there are some characters who use reach weapons. For them, they don't get to make an opportunity attack unless an enemy moves more than 10 feet away from them, right? And this can actually sometimes allow an enemy to like skirt around a player that has a reach weapon, just sort of keeping a five foot gap between them and then getting to one of your allies without taking an opportunity attack, and I hate when that happens. But guess what? We are a Thrykreen, and this means we can dual wield short swords and still be able to equip a whip in one of our main hands. And yes, the beauty of the whip here is that it's the only weapon in game with reach that's not two-handed. And we want to keep one of our hands free for grappling, right? Right. So now, if an enemy tries to move out of our immediate vicinity from right next to us, we can hit them with an opportunity attack with one of our short swords and thanks to the sentinel feet, freeze them in place. Also, if they are 10 feet away from us and try and move away, we can hit them with an opportunity attack from our whip and freeze them in place too. Oh, and don't forget another big upside to Giant's Might. When it's active, we are at large size, meaning we take up a bigger area on the battlefield and can potentially hit more enemies with our opportunity attacks and prevent more enemies from getting around us thanks to our reach than we otherwise could if we were medium sized, right? So at this point, we're a pretty nice little praying mantis character. We have a fairly hefty like zone of control, if you will. We take up a lot of room. We're stopping enemies in their tracks if they try to move away from us in basically like a six by six area on the grid. It's like a 30 foot blob on the field that bad guys are gonna have a hard time getting past. And of course, we're an amazing grappler. It's speaking of, you could definitely stow that whip and grapple two targets here if you think that's going to be more effective in this particular fight. Or if there's just one baddie and you wanna grapple them, go ahead and stow your whip, pull out your shield, grapple them with your other arm, enjoying that extra two armor class while they're probably trying to attack you as you've got them in your bear hug. I love the versatility and the options that we have with this build, so fun. Or I guess on the other hand, if you're just looking to do as much damage as you possibly can to a single enemy, yeah, feel free to pull out a great sword or a maul now because at level five, we get extra attack. And yes, this means that we could take advantage of two weapon fighting and make one attack with a big two-handed weapon on our turn like I discussed in the preamble, if we really wanted. When I crunch numbers, I'm just going to assume that we're making short sword attacks and I'll explain why when I get there. At level six, because we're a fighter, we get another ability score increase or feat and I think bumping strength here is a no brainer. 
now that we've got Sentinel, it just helps us with our grapples as well as our plus to hit and plus to damage. So yeah, let's bump it, take it to an 18. And so at level six, it's time for our first damage report. Here's how I envision combat working currently on our turn. Round one, you'd activate Giant Smite with your bonus action, then simply run up to the enemy that you most want to control and grapple them. Remember, this takes one of our attacks when we take the attack action. We do have two thanks to extra attack, so assuming you grapple them successfully, you use your second attack to shove the enemy, knocking them prone. For those unfamiliar with this tactic, you can shove an enemy even if you have them grappled, and it's kind of the same thing as when you try to grapple someone. You make an athletics check versus their athletics or acrobatics, and if you succeed, you either push them five feet away from you or knock them prone. I assume that we're going to want to knock them prone here. And of course, if an enemy is prone, their attacks are made with disadvantage and attacks from within five feet of them are made with advantage. Worse for them, standing up from prone requires half of their move speed, but if they're grappled, their move speed is zero. So they are essentially pinned until they break that grapple. If you have action surge or on subsequent turns, round two, you know, you just start going ham on them with your short swords and all of your attacks would be made with advantage. I would probably keep the whip in my main hand that's not grappling the enemy to use to like freeze enemies in place who are trying to move away from me from 10 feet out, right? But again, you could always stow it and grapple a second target or pull out a shield. So yes, at this point, we are locking down multiple enemies on the battlefield, taking up a big chunk of real estate that bad guys are having a hard time getting around and just kind of making life miserable for the one or two enemies that we have grappled, making it really difficult for them to move or attack effectively. And even if they do break our grapple, it costs them their action to do so, which is already a win for us and our team. And like, then what are they gonna do? If they try to run away, we'll probably just freeze them in place with an opportunity attack, thanks to Sentinel, and then on our turn, we'll just run up and grapple them again, right? Now, as for our damage, I'm just assuming three short sword attacks made with advantage on a prone enemy, adding an extra d6 once per turn thanks to Giant's Might. And that advantage that we're getting from grappling and knocking an enemy prone is going to be better for our damage, at least at mid and higher enemy armor classes, than using, you know, a two-handed weapon and two short swords would. And that's why I wouldn't go that route, even for damage purposes. Unless it's an enemy that you know has a super low AC and you don't otherwise need to grapple them. Oh, also, as for our frost rune, you could of course forego your bonus action short sword attack on round two to activate it. We used our bonus action on round one for giant's might. I'd probably only do so if the enemy that you were grappling seemed like particularly strong or dexterous, maybe especially if your attempt to grapple or shove them on round one failed. Now, Am I going to assume that we're getting a reaction attack against an enemy every single round? I mean, I'm hoping that you'll get to make a reaction attack every round, especially since Sentinel Feet lets you make a reaction attack against an enemy within five feet of you that attacks someone other than you. So between that and all the opportunity attacks you could potentially be getting, I think it's pretty safe to assume that you'll get a lot of reaction attacks on this character. In some combat encounters, it might be every fight or almost every fight, but it's just so hard to know exactly how your DM is going to play the enemies on your battlefield. And since it's pretty far outside of my control, I'm going to say, let's just assume that we'll get a reaction attack half of the time. That feels conservative enough to me to throw it into the numbers as we're crunching them. Feel free to bump the numbers up or down if you think that's too generous or too restrictive. But under all of those assumptions, against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, we would on average do 31 damage per round, and against an enemy with a 15 armor class, it would be 28 DPR. And okay, not amazing. It's kind of like bottom of tier three slash top of tier four compared to other sustained DPR builds that I've done to date. And remember, or in case you didn't know, we now have five tiers for sustained DPR. Check this video here if you want to see me talk about them. But anyway, it's by no means like the lowest of the DPR builds that I've done. And again, damage is really a secondary concern for this character. We are locking down multiple enemies, which is fantastic, and doing some decent damage. Not to mention that we could and probably should be wearing plate armor by now. And since at least one of our enemies is going to have disadvantage on their attacks against us, I'm hoping, since they're prone, our survivability should be pretty great here as well. But at level seven, with our extra attack, that nice level six ability score increase her feet and our giant's might features in place, I think it's time to leave fighter behind for a bit. I'd like to take a class that can get me a little more damage 
make me an even better grappler and even add some nice utility and defensive features. I mentioned that this Queen's Defender was trained in both the martial and magical arts, right? Well, it turns out that they are now also being trained in the arts of subterfuge and misdirection. They're learning to better defend from the shadows, perhaps, or at least be better able to hide in plain sight, vigilant while unseen, and learning some additional tricks to employ in the way they protect their charges. Regardless of your reasons, we are going to be taking some rogue levels here. Is this the second strength-based rogue character that I've made in the last month? Why, yes. Yes, it is. How marvelous. So as a rogue one, we get Thieves Cant, which is the special coded language that rogues can use to communicate with one another and anybody else who speaks it. And then of course we also get Sneak Attack, which does an additional 1d6 points of damage on a turn. And as a reminder, in case you missed the Berserker Lurker episode, yes, there's no reason why you cannot make attacks with strength and still get sneak attack damage. The requirement to get that extra once per turn damage is that the weapon be a finesse or ranged weapon, not that you use dexterity to make the attack. And short swords are finesse weapons. Also, of course, the attack has to be made with advantage against an enemy or against an enemy that is within five feet of one of your allies. So if the enemy's prone because you've got them grappled and shoved, you have advantage, hooray. If they're not, keep in mind, again, that you can drag an enemy at half move speed when you've got them grappled, so if you need to drag them over to an ally before you make attacks, do so, and then you can get sneak attack. One other thing to keep in mind, yes, as I've said, and as I also tried to take advantage of in that Berserker Lurker episode, among others, like the Swashbuckler Nova, do I even have any cards left? <laughs> I might not. Anyway, you can apply sneak attack damage against an enemy once on a turn, meaning that if you're making an opportunity attack against an enemy, which happens when they move on their turn, or you're getting your sentinel reaction attack when that enemy attacks one of your allies, again, happening on their turn, then you can apply your sneak attack damage to that reaction attack as well, so long as you otherwise meet the requirements for sneak attack, right? And that's another reason why whips are so great for us here, because not only are they the only one-handed weapon with reach, but they're the only reach weapon with the finesse property, meaning that regardless of whether the enemy we hit with our opportunity attack is five feet away from us or 10 feet away from us, we can potentially be adding sneak attack damage to that opportunity attack. And that's just awesome. But one of the main reasons why we wanted to go rogue is for the expertise feature, which we get here at level one. Expertise lets us double our proficiency bonus in two skills that we're proficient in, and so naturally we will want to take athletics first and foremost. With Giant's Might and Frost Rune active, this would give us a plus 12 to our athletics checks currently, and we would be making those with advantage. And that's pretty incredible for a level seven character. As for the other thing that you would want to take expertise in here, it really depends. I think if you don't have another rogue or scout-like character in your party, I'd probably go stealth or even thieves tools here. At a 16 dexterity with double our proficiency bonus, we'd be pretty dang good in either of those things. Keeping in mind, of course, that if we're wearing plate mail armor, we might want to either find some mithril or simply doff it and take the slightly lower AC so as to not suffer disadvantage on our stealth checks, right? But if there's already a great lockpicker scout in the party, I'd probably go perception personally, but pick your favorite. At level eight, we would be a rogue two and we get cunning action. This tells us that we can take the hide, dash, or disengage actions as a bonus action, and this is always useful, especially, say, if we really need to drag an enemy a little bit further of a distance and we need to dash to get them there after we've grappled them, right? Hiding as a bonus action does seem super effective for a Thrykreen who might have built a little differently, focusing more on hiding and probably attacking from range for, like, reliable advantage. But that's not really what we're going for with this build, yeah. At level 9, we would be a Rogue 3, and our sneak attack damage goes up to 2d6, 
and we get our roguish archetype, our rogue subclass. And we're gonna go with the arcane trickster, kind of furthering that idea of training both in martial and magical abilities. We're a little bit of a gishy character here, especially if you consider the rune knight's abilities as kind of pseudo-magical, right? I've got one very specific reason for wanting to go with the arcane trickster here, but we're not gonna be getting to it for quite a few levels. For now, we get Mage Hand Ledger Domain, which lets you make your Mage Hand invisible when you cast it, as well as allow it to stow or retrieve objects, and even use Thieves Tools from range. And you can even use your bonus action from Cunning Action to control it, so that's wicked awesome. Some really nice kind of utility features now for an already pretty cool cantrip. But then yes, we do learn spells here, and we, we get Mage Hand first up, as well as some additional cantrips and first level spells. Two of the three first level spells that we learn here have to be from the Enchantment or Illusion schools. As far as what to pick, remember we dumped Intelligence, and that's our spellcasting modifier here for Arcane Tricksters. So I would avoid taking any spells that call for a spell attack, roll, or an enemy saving throw, since our chance of success is going to be pretty low. Message could be pretty good for when you need to communicate back and forth and your Thrykreen telepathy just isn't good enough. Silvery Barbs is a fantastic enchantment spell that forces a successful enemy attack roll, saving throw, or yes, ability check to be re-rolled. That could be really handy, especially if you're trying to grapple or shove and they succeed, among other things though it would cost your reaction to use it, so use it wisely. Also with Silvery Barbs, you would then get to grant advantage to yourself or an ally on your next attack, save, or ability check that you make within the next minute. Very handy. As for the non-enchantment or illusion spell that we'd take here, I think I'd probably go with Find Familiar, as I often do on Arcane Tricksters, since having a familiar is just so dang useful for scouting purposes, not to mention to grant advantage by taking the help action on an attack of yours or one of your allies. You could take the shield spell here instead for better defense, but we have a lot of demands on our reaction right now and it's just gonna get worse, so I think I'd pass on shield personally for this character. Here's a question. If we are dual wielding short swords, do we need the Warcaster feat in order to cast spells with somatic and or material components? Well, guess what? We're a Thrykreen. We have four hands. One other nice little perk, right? Now, sure, if we had an enemy grappled in one main hand and a whip, or another enemy grappled in the other, and we were dual wielding short swords, we might be in trouble. But I don't anticipate casting a lot of spells with this character once combat has begun, at least not that have material or somatic components. Silvery Barbs is a verbal component only, so I'm really just not too worried about it. I think we'll be okay. For our level 9 damage report then, since last check our tactics haven't changed much but we've added a little more damage once per turn thanks to sneak attack, as well as a lot of great utility via our roguish features and spells, and much stronger grapples and shoves thanks to expertise. That said, assuming we get a reaction attack half of the time, I am going to assume best case scenario and apply our sneak attack damage to that half of an attack since we'd be making that reaction attack on someone else's turn and thus could potentially be using sneak attack if we had advantage or if the enemy were next to one of our allies, right? And thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, we would do 43 damage per round on average and against an enemy with a 16 armor class, it would be 39 DPR. And that's not a huge increase since last check, landing us a little more kind of firmly in the middle of tier 4 compared to other DPR builds at this level, but again, our primary focus is on control, so being able to put out some respectable damage while we're at it is just kind of gravy. And the damage is actually going to get significantly better from this point on. At level 10, we would be a rogue 4 and we get another ability score increase or feat. I think we've got a bump strength here and just cap it at 20. I'm really happy to have done that. Again, improving both our damage and our control. At level 11, we would be a rogue 5. Our sneak attack damage goes up to 3d6 and we get uncanny dodge, which tells us that when an attacker, you can see, hits you with an attack, you can use your reaction to have the damage against you. And yeah, that's nice, but for us, maybe a little less nice. We have so many uses of our reaction already. A potential sentinel reaction attack, an opportunity attack from 5 or 10 feet away, silvery barbs, cloud rune. I'm probably only using uncanny dodge like 
if I get hit by a critical or if I'm really close to death or maybe it's like my turn next and I haven't otherwise used my reaction yet, so I know I'm gonna get it back soon, right? Something like that. At level 12, we would be a rogue six, and we get expertise part de. I'm gonna say pick your favorite. Again, if you're acting as the party's main lock picker and scout, at this point, I would be sure to have expertise in stealth, thieves tools, and sleight of hand, as well as athletics, of course. But if you're not, Again, feel free to take investigation and insight along with maybe perception that you took last time, right? Lots of options. PYF. At level 13, we would be a rogue 7. Our sneak attack damage goes up to 4d6. And we get evasion, which is a super fantastic ability, telling us that if we have to make a dexterity saving throw to take half damage against something like a fireball or a trap, we only take half damage if we fail and no damage if we succeed. I love evasion. But we also do get second level spells here, and this is important. Now, the spells that we take at this level have to be from the illusion or enchantment schools. We don't get another non-illusion or enchantment spell until next level, oddly. I think the ones I would take here would probably be mirror image to make ourselves a little harder to hit as the spell creates some illusory duplicates of yourself that the enemy might inadvertently attack instead of you and that's always fun and for the second one I mean I don't have a great use of my concentration right now and I could use a little more damage so sure why not let's take shadow blade it's an illusion spell and it also just happens to have the light and finesse properties. Thank you very much. So now at least one of our praying mantis mandibles got a little bit more bite to it in the form of psychic damage. And that makes me smile. As a reminder, though I'm sure anyone who's watched my channel for any length of time doesn't need a reminder on what Shadowblade does. <laughs> Shadowblade is cast with a bonus action, requires our concentration, and summons an illusory blade into your hand that does 2d8 psychic damage, and that's way better than 1d6 from the short sword. So, sure. Next time I crunch numbers, I'm going to assume that your two action attacks are made with a shadow blade, as well as the half of the time reaction attacks we get, though I appreciate that that might occasionally be made with a whip if you're getting an opportunity attack against someone 10 feet away from you, right? But yes, this is all just in time for our next damage report. And a lot has changed since last check. Our sneak attack damage has gone up by an additional 2d6 for 4d6 total, and we're making two and a half of our attacks with a 2d8 shadow blade, though I do appreciate you're gonna have to spend a bonus action summoning it. We've also capped our strength score and picked up some nice defensive and utility options. We are like the best praying mantis ever right now. This is the peak of our praying mantisness. <laughs> And so, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would do, on average, 73 DPR, and against an enemy with a 17 armor class, it would be 69. Nice. That's a pretty nice bump. Thanks, Shadowblade. We're now more like top end of tier 3 compared to other sustained DPR builds at this level, and we are getting a lot more well-rounded to boot. Happy days. We're coming down the home stretch at level 14 we would be a rogue eight and we get another ability score increase or feat i don't have really strong feelings about what to take here i think i'd probably bump my constitution and take it to an 18 for both more hit points and a better saving throw especially now that we're reliably concentrating on a spell right since it helps our concentration checks too you might want to take warcaster for advantage on those concentration checks and so you don't have to worry about casting with your hands Full. Alternatively, you might want to go with like Resilient Wisdom, since our Wisdom score is so horrid, and thus our Wisdom saving throws are just atrocious. Or, potentially, I would consider going with the Dual Wielder feat, even. Most people take this feat so that the weapons they dual wield don't have to be light, but that's not going to help us, since our little T-Rex arms are specifically limited to using light weapons only, regardless of whether we had this feat or not. That said, we could potentially get a bump to our armor class with the feat, but there's a potential hiccup there. The feat says that you get a plus one to your AC, quote, while you are wielding a separate melee weapon in each hand. Ah, so there is a drawback to having too many hands. <laughs> I mean, your DM may just say that as long as you're wielding a separate melee weapon in two of your hands, you're fine, since this feat was created back when playing a character with two hands was really the only option. But 
strictly rules as written, you would need to have a weapon in all four of your hands in order to benefit here. And that's just not going to be worth it for us, obviously. So talk it over with your DM if you're considering going this route. Most importantly though, and the main reason I wanted to go all the way to Rogue 8 on this character, as well as take the Arcane Trickster for our subclass, is that at level 8, we can switch out another one of our spells for a non-enchantment or illusion spell, and that means that we can now get and make use of the Enlarge Reduce spell. I guess technically we could have dumped Find Familiar at the last level and taken Enlarge Reduce then, but... I really like Find Familiar. Anyway, yes, with Enlarge Reduce, among other things, this means that we could first use Giant's Might on our turn as a bonus action to make ourselves large, and then cast Enlarge on ourselves to make ourselves huge. Since the spell increases the size of the creature you cast it on by one size category. And since, you'll recall, we can only grapple creatures that are one size larger than us or smaller. And since the only thing that's bigger than huge is gargantuan, that means we could potentially now grapple any creature in the game, and that is awesome. And some of you may even feel like we took too long to get here. You may be right, we could have dipped three levels into like Sorcerer or Wizard and gotten this spell sooner, but I didn't like how mad that made us, multiple ability score dependent, I wanted to have a decent dexterity. and. I guess I'm just hoping that we're not going to be seeing a ton of gargantuan sized enemies before level 14. So I didn't feel too bad about the delay. But yes, of course, using this spell would mean no Shadow Blade since both require concentration, but I'm only anticipating that you would actually use this once in a great while. I just wanted to have the option to do so when necessary. At level 15, now that we've got Enlarge Reduce, I think we can consider going back to Fighter. Rune Knight gets some nice additional abilities, and there's another ability score to increase her feet waiting for us soon as well with Fighter. Perhaps most importantly, if you're taking this character to level 19 and beyond, level 11 fighter means that amazing third attack when we take the attack action, right? So I think I would go that route here if it were me. And that means as a fighter 7 and a rune knight, we get the runic shield ability. As if we didn't already have enough things competing for our reaction, now we get one more. With Runic Shield, proficiency bonus times per day, when a creature we can see within 60 feet of us gets hit by an attack, we can use our reaction to force the attacker to reroll. So kinda like Silvery Barbs, but only for attacks and without the little advantage rider for you or an ally. Of course, it doesn't take a spell slot, and it could be really nice in a pinch, but just be careful when using this since there are so many other things that we want our reaction for, right? Again, I think I'm probably only using it if it would mean negating a critical hit, or if it were the difference between life and death, right? And yeah, speaking of too many uses of our reaction, we do get a third rune here as well as a rune knight, and while the storm rune is arguably the more powerful of the seventh level options now available to us, it also also uses our reaction potentially every single round for a minute, and I think I'd just be really frustrated if I had it constantly second-guessing myself as to whether or not I should use my reaction on this or the billion other things that I want my reaction for. For that reason, I think I'm probably either going to take the hill rune or the fire rune here. With hill rune, you invoke it as a bonus action and would then have resistance to all bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for one whole minute, and that's really, really nice for our survival survivability, since, as most of you know, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage is the majority of the damage that we tend to take in D&D 5e. That said, I think I'd probably be even more tempted on this character to go with the Fire Rune, since it does a little extra damage once per short rest, but then can potentially restrain an enemy that you hit with a weapon attack, shackling them in fiery chains that they would have to make a strength save against. And that just gives us one more cool little tool for control on the battlefield, and that's kind of the point of this character, right? I mean, at this point, with Fire Rune, you might grapple one enemy, then hit a second enemy with your second attack, even using your whip if you needed to and they were 10 feet away, try to restrain them with the fire rune on your turn, not needing to rely on your sentinel opportunity attack to shut them down, right? And then, yeah, you still could, with your reaction, potentially lock somebody else down with an opportunity attack. So it just gives us one more way to really exert control and freeze our enemies in place on the battlefield, and that's awesome. It's going to go a long, long way to keeping your squishier backline allies safe. At level 16, we would be a fighter 8, 
and we get another ability score increase her feet and again i think i'm probably going to bump my constitution here capping it at 20 for better hit points better saving throws better concentration checks especially if we decided to take the fire rune since the saving throw that the enemy makes to see if they get shackled and restrained is improved by our constitution modifier if you decided to instead go with one of the other feats that we talked about earlier i wouldn't blame you but then finally, for us, at level 17, I'm gonna go back to Rogue. <laughs> I know, I know. Again, if I were actually playing this character in-game and was going to get to level 19 or 20, I really would stick fighter. But since I always end my builds at level 17 and the next fighter level would just be indomitable, which I hate, and by contrast another rogue level would give us more sneak attack damage and I'm a slave to the spreadsheet, I guess I'll end at rogue 9. <laughs> Sue me. And yeah, as a rogue nine, we would get magical ambush as an arcane trickster, and that's really not that awesome for us. It tells us that if we're hidden from a creature when we cast a spell on them, then they have disadvantage on their saving throw. Since we have an eight intelligence, that's really not doing that much for us. Again, though, I think there's totally a like dex and intelligence focused arcane trickster thrykeen rogue build here that, you know, is just really taking advantage of all of the great things we get when we hide. It's just not this build. And then yes, our sneak attack damage here gets bumped to a 5d6. And thus, for our final damage report, since last check our sneak attack has gone up by another 1d6, but other than that, our gains have really all pretty much been in the defense, support, and utility departments, including a little more potential control and damage, I guess, from Fire Rune, and the ability to grapple even gargantuan enemies thanks to the Enlarge Reduce spell. But against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, we would on average do 79 damage per round, and against an enemy with an 18 armor class, it would be 74 DPR. And yeah, we didn't really scale a lot since last check, so not surprisingly, we've kind of slipped back to maybe like bottom half of tier 3 compared to other sustained DPR builds at this level. But again, with everything else that we are bringing to the table, that's pretty dang good. All right, let's talk final thoughts. The tier score for this character, when you take all of the damage that they do at all of the armor classes we calculate for and at every damage report that we report on, would be a 49.2. And this puts them firmly in the upper half of tier 3, just ahead of the Spore Beast and right below the Great Weapon Master Fighter Barbarian, which is honestly a heck of a lot higher than I thought they'd be when I started this character. I know I say that a lot. Sorry. I guess I must sandbag everything in my head. Now, granted, I am assuming that this character is getting a reaction attack on half of their turns and applying sneak attack damage to that, and I understand that won't always be the case. I'm also assuming that you have advantage thanks to your enemy being grappled and shoved, and I know it's going to take us a round to get there unless we have action surge available. So yeah, as with almost every single build that I do, there are some caveats, some grains of salt, and that's okay by me just so long as we're aware of what they are. But the best part of this character, of course, is how much fun they would be to play. Imagine being a large or even huge character on the battlefield, grappling one, maybe two enemies, and just going all like Drax the Destroyer on them while they're pinned to the ground, right? While you are potentially lashing out with your blade or maybe even whip to stop enemies in their tracks who are trying to get around you to your allies, shackling them, sometimes protecting your allies by forcing your enemies to re roll their attacks, or even occasionally just choosing an enemy altogether to be the victim of a successful enemy attack, and bringing a lot of durability and utility to the table as well. It sounds like just a gargantuan beast of a disruptor and controller, and I think it'd be a blast to play. So I certainly hope that you and I both get to try it sometime soon. Now I promised an alternative build for those who are more interested in getting a little more damage here at the cost of some control. And this is basically how it would work. Instead of dual wielding short swords, we would use a hand crossbow in one of our baby arms and leave the other baby arm free. And we wouldn't be using a whip at all. You'd take the archery fighting style, of course, and then at level four, you'd go crossbow expert. At level six, you'd go sharpshooter and forego the sentinel feet altogether. Instead of using the whip in your main hand, I would equip a shield or just plan on grappling a second enemy. You'd use one T-Rex arm to wield and fire the hand crossbow and the other to reload it. Now, 
in case that makes you nervous, even though we're not told that these baby arms are specifically capable of reloading a crossbow, among the other things that they can do, they can be used to manipulate an object, and rules state that to load a weapon with a loading property, we just need a free hand. So I would think that all but the stingiest DMs here would allow this. Anyway, the idea here is still to grapple an enemy or two, knock them prone, and then just fire the hand crossbow into them at point-blank range, which we can do without disadvantage thanks to the crossbow expert feat, right? But we actually would have advantage thanks to them being prone and us being only within five feet of them. When we have the archery fighting style and we've got the sharpshooter feat going, that's some pretty big potential damage. Of course, without the sentinel feat and the whip, you would be locking down targets less often. And as a ranged character focusing on dexterity, your grapples would be less effective. But if you can still start with a 16 strength and get expertise in athletics and advantage on your athletics checks from Giant's Might, not to mention a frost rune, you've still got a very strong athletics check. So it could still be a pretty effective controller and do significantly more damage too. So something to consider, I think it'd be kind of fun to be like a point blank crossbow expert user who's grappling their targets. Um, definitely unique and cool, but regardless that those are the builds for the week and I hope you enjoyed them as much as I enjoyed creating them. Mostly though, I hope you know how much I love you because I do and you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for all of your support, everything you do, liking, subscribing, commenting, and especially joining the channel as a member. Big thanks and shout out to my channel members. I hope you have a fantastic week. I hope that you stay safe and that you be good and kind and happy and that I see you again really soon. But until then, take care. Bye. What in the world is my hair doing? It's like some kind of pompadour. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie, I'm so glad you're mine, so glad you will be together a long time. Sometimes it seems you're not with me It hurts me so much It hurts me so much For this, for, for, for arcane, for arcane tricksters I love you so much I love you so much If you're a Weezer fan and you don't know the song Jamie it came out like in the 90s on some rarities album. Look it up. Check it out. It's like my favorite song of theirs, I think. Of course, there are some characters who use reach weapons. Yikes. Why are you sagging? Don't sag, Mike. Okay. Are you going to sag? No sagging. Mike doesn't want to sit still. So again, could, well, never mind. Don't say that. We already have advantage. Me, 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 me. What's it called? <laughs> Two enemies that. Can you guys hear the? Yeah, you probably can.